I believe that obstacles are just illusions created by fear. And the more fears we let go of, the fewer obstacles we have in our way. At least that's the philosophy I try to live my life by. So with that said, this film may shock you and challenge your belief system, but I hope it also entertains you and changes the way you think. Jane lived in Madison, Ohio with her mother until she was 26. At that time, she moved out with her brother Tim, who she lived with for a couple of years until she moved into her dream house, a log cabin, with her friend Alan. After three years, they decided country life wasn't for them, and Jane got her own apartment in Geneva. Uh, no, not that Geneva. After an undesirable renting experience, Jane decided it was time to buy her own home with the help of a car accident settlement. Hold on, rewind. Let's go back to the beginning. Jane was born in 1974, the youngest of five children and the only girl. She had 26 fractures when she was born. 12 of the 26 fractures were skull fractures. And I was told at the time that there was just no way she could survive that. I was told that uh, she would only survive for about two or three hours. And the three hours passed. And uh, before the day was done, they changed it to three days. And at the end of two weeks, uh, they started sho shoving papers at me to put Jane in an institution. And uh, just chose not to go that route. Well, when I refused to sign any papers and let them have her, uh, they said, okay, fine, take her home. They gave me a 15-day-old baby with 26 unset fractures, and I didn't even know where they were. <laughs> she couldn't be alone at any time. When she was sleeping, I had to sleep with my hand on her. I never told Jane that she was disabled, handicapped, crippled. I never said any of those words. None of us did, my entire family. What we did tell her is, you can do anything and everything everyone else does. You just have to find a different way to do it. I've never had the ability to walk. Before I had a wheelchair, I would scoot around the house on my butt. And as a toddler, I didn't understand why I couldn't walk. So I was always plodding a way to get on my feet. I would stack up my storybooks like steps, and then I would scoot up the steps and take a leap off the top, and then I'd fall and break a bone. This only happened a couple of times before my mom caught on and limited me to two or three books. Something else that was a challenge for her family during the early years was her ability to hide under the furniture. If it was time for her to go to bed or clean up her toys and she didn't feel like it, she would just hide. She didn't realize the terror that this caused her family. They knew that if one of them sat on the couch and Jane was hiding under it, that she could be killed. If Jane was going to go to school, to the public school, I had to go with her. And I did. I went every day. I took her, I stayed there, and then I brought her home. And it was a benefit to the teachers and the faculty as well, her presence in the school, especially 
in the elementary and junior high years because little kids can be very unpredictable and they're full of energy and I was just as much of a hazard to myself as the other kids were. So the teachers could focus on teaching and my mother was kind of a bodyguard babysitter. We met in kindergarten. I walked up and she looked right me dead in the eye and said, what the fuck are you looking at? Because obviously I was staring. Seeing all the breaks, all the sprains, all the, you know, writing with her feet because she can't write with her arms because they're broken. Seeing her hurt so many times in just natural ways. I mean, in high school, a penny hit her head and it fractured her skull. You know, kids became so accustomed to Jane that she was just one of the kids. She never was viewed as being special or anything. She never got any advantages, that's for sure. Um, the only advantage she got was that she could blow her horn as she went down the hallway to get everybody out of the way. But besides that, she had no advantages. She had to fight for everything that she got. When I was in college and I became involved with the student organization for students with disabilities, it wasn't long after I joined that differences became really evident. I had a home health aide with me and they didn't. And they kind of had the perspective of poor Jane, she has to have this aid with her at the time and we have all this independence and can do whatever I want. And so I clarified to them that I still have my independence. They don't tell me what to do. So then the issue of having a catheter came up. They brought it to my attention. This was not a concept that ever crossed my mind because to me, catheters are for people who are not in control of their bodily functions. My equipment works just fine and I'm gonna use it as long as it works. Jane has a self-appointed home health aide through a government-funded program that helps her with things she can't do for herself, like getting out of bed, bathing, and meal preparation. Where the day goes from there is always a surprise. She's not afraid of anything. She's not afraid to go anywhere or, or be anywhere with anybody. She's amazingly independent. It's always more fun when Jane comes to the show. limitations to me. One of the things I love most about being a part of the artist community is that it provides endless opportunities to meet interesting people. 
especially the more intimate music venues like drum circles, which is where I met my witchy belly dancing henna tattoo artist friend, Melissa. I mean, I totally love her. She's really very small. My Aunt Jane is a bit eccentric. I don't try to explain some of the things she does. I just love her. And you know they say that apple doesn't fall too far from the truth. But the first time I got shot, that was different. That was just a shooting accident when I was a kid, you know, and they had to operate and take bullets out. But this, uh, well, there's no way. The last time I got shot, it just went in one side and out the other. And it, 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 it was um, not a real fun time. Yeah, you never let Aunt Jane babysit. Uh-oh. I don't babysit. He did once. I'm not a baby person. They smell. I don't like them. They're always moving around, screaming, and they smell bad. I don't want to hold them. I don't want to smell them. Yeah. But, and they're always sticky. And they smell. I mean, even when they're oiled up and all that, <laughs> yeah. they stick around. <laughs> they still stink. They have that odor about them. You will not wake up until you're back. You will not wake up. You don't have to do a thing. As soon as they're out in the driveway, the kid wakes up. Scream. Oh, don't do it. So, first of all, I thought, well, my God Almighty, he's probably starving because there's this itty bitty little hole in the bottom. So I got the scissors and I cut, I cut the, a big top. Well, the kid had to eat, didn't he? And then that didn't turn out too successfully. Because <laughs> when I turned the bottle over, of course it, well, then his diaper needed to be changed. Well, I don't do that either. So the six-year-old was there, and he did everything except the pins. I did the pins. Is that why you never let her watch me? That'd be one reason. <laughs> I, no, the infants I have totally no use for. I feel the same way my Aunt Jane does about babies. However, when I was 18, my niece Brooke was born. I've always played a parental figure in her life, and I'm grateful for the experience. She's all grown up now and has a life of her own, which revolves mainly around horses. Unfortunately, I don't have that great of a relationship with every member of my family. My mom has five kids. Where do you fall in the five? I'm the youngest, but he's the baby. Right. And uh, he always told me he was going to kill me and how he was going to do it. You know? And Did you tell anybody? Um, no, because it was a family secret, but I was told, if you tell anybody, it's nobody's business. Let the people think of our family if they know. And if I got taken away, I wouldn't go to a foster home. I'd go in an institution. Jane, how little were you? Like, what is your earliest memories of... of the first time I called the police on him when he put a gun on us, I was seven. Oh, my God. I was in kindergarten and I had just memorized my first friend's phone number and I called it and I got her mom and I said, 
can I come over? Because my brother's going to shoot us. <laughs> so he was only like 14 or 15. Oh my God. Is he like, di is he diagnosed? He never been to a doctor for that. I love my mom, and she's a master bullshitter. And she protects her kids at any cost, even if she's protecting them from each other, and or thinks that she's protecting them from each other. Right. I could elaborate on this subject, but I try not to poke crazy with a stick. Try this candy I made. You're gonna love the ones with the light sprinkles. Tim James brother. Yeah, I work at the nuclear power plant. Been there 16 years now. Started out in maintenance, moved to operations. Now I'm the site FME coordinator. Good job, nice place to work. Uh, found out she was my sister early teens, pre-teens maybe. Uh, about the same time found out who our father was. I always knew he was my brother though. He just thought I was his dad's friend's baby. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Hey, who the hell is this? Why are we going over here to visit this girl? And grandma started to talk a little bit. I remember there was a Christmas too and you were like three, four. You were really dinky. And you came over to grandma's house for Christmas. Aunt Joyce, everybody was there. But again, you were just some weird little girl that used to come over on the holidays. So then after we became adults, we decided to live together. And since he was like this mystery brother, I had this whole fantasy. Because I don't have the best relationship with the brothers I grew up with who are my mother's children from a previous marriage. I had this fantasy in my head that he was this perfect person and we're gonna get a house together and have some normal family. I don't know what I was thinking. But that lasted about two years. In that time, I realized he's not perfect. And neither am I. Then I came to the realization that the past really just doesn't fucking matter. But I had him first. It doesn't matter? I, yes, you broke the way, so it doesn't apply. I didn't know! Huh? I didn't know! You backed in while we were doing it! I didn't see anything. You didn't know it was happening? Oh, we're both no. naked? He wasn't naked. Yes, he was. Wow. <laughs> you were just really drunk. I remember it being really drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember him being naked. One of the many hazards of living in a small town with a gay brother 
is the risk of accidentally dating the same guy. Oops. Growing up in Madison, Ohio, on a late jury, it was unspoken tradition to lose your virginity at the Madison Township Park. Due to my bone condition, though, I was told that I could not have sex and would not have a normal sex life. By the time I reached my early 20s, though, I came to the conclusion that if I did have sex, the worst thing that could happen is I would break a bone. But by the time I reached my 20s, I had already had at least 200 fractures, so it was worth it to me to find out. So even though I was a little bit late, I did follow tradition, and I'm still alive. And luckily, I do not have a normal sex life. I've had male lovers as well as female, including my long-distance relationship with Bella Via, who lives in New Orleans. Mm. Challenging. I can imagine yes. explaining to people that you, you have relationships. Nonetheless, you have alternative relationships. Has to be. Alternative and All sorts of fun. average sized and not to say boot. Maybe I just subconsciously go for the exact opposite of what's expected. And we can't pick a side. No. I can't pick a side. Because we love everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I tried dating a little guy once, but like he had to use a step ladder to get on my bed. Oh, jeez. That was so not hot. No. In my early 20s, I had a serious drinking problem. It was just my way of coping with everything in my life that was making me unhappy. I was working, serving at, at a winery, and uh, she appeared. And certain friends of mine started to give her alcohol and to, to, you know, get her, proceed to get her drunk. I kept telling her, stop, don't drink so much, you know, and by the time I came around, she was completely and utterly passed out at her chair, wasted off her ass. And um, I knew her mom was picking her up down the street, and here's Jane passed out in her wheelchair and has no way of getting down the street. It looked like I had killed her. She literally head to the side, drooling. I never saw a woman so pissed off in my life when her mom pulled up and saw me steering her down the street with her passed out and her coming to the realization that her daughter's 21 and she's gonna have a good time and she may overdo it sometimes but I never feared for my life as I did that night. The wagon wheel was my favorite bow because I could drive there in my wheelchair and the female bartenders would take me to the bathroom so I could keep drinking. Now that is customer service. People bring joy to this establishment, some when they come and some when they leave. Depending on how much Jane had to drink, I make the decision. I run a mission, the self destruction, and we be drinking. We said, I don't even know that we got. I want a drink now. Not when we get home. Now. Can't you just wait 10 more minutes? We're almost home. If we had taken so fucking long in the grocery store, we would have been home and I would have had my fucking drink by now. I want it now. I'm not waiting any longer. Just pull over. Okay, okay, okay. I'll pull over right here.
I should have driven my sack. Let's go. And at 55 pounds, I could drink as much as my average sized ones. And I did. A lot. Until one day I woke up from a blackout and I had a fractured ankle, a dislocated kneecap, and a nice big puddle of my own puke. And when I woke up that morning, I knew that if I continued down that destructive path, I would die. My body is not designed for that. And I'm worthy of much better. As painful as that entire experience was, I'm glad it happened exactly the way it did. No, I would not have stopped, and I would not be here. And I haven't had a drop of alcohol since 2001. One of the more colorful characters I met when I was in college, still a good friend of mine, his name is Todd. The organization I was in for students with disabilities shared an office with another organization for students who were veterans. And Todd was in the veterans club. And he showed me a picture of himself when he was doing drag when he was in the military. And it wasn't good. He needed some help. So uh, my good friend Emily and I kind of took him under our wings and helped make him the woman he is today. But it was great for me because I was a huge fan of Tu Wong Fu and I always wanted my own drag princess. And they were over my house like every other weekend, it seemed like. Mm -hmm. And that's how we all became close. It was like this uh, super friendship type of thing. I was born almost 33 years ago as Todd Herman Poole. Um, and I spent the first 32 years of my life as a male. And um, she's kind of the person that really brought me out of the closet. So I wasn't really thinking about so you're black. <laughs> <laughs> cracker white. Cracker and I wasn't white. thinking about that because I don't see them as cracker white. I see them as you know regular white. <laughs> so and I lived in this apartment building called the Crystal Towers. And uh, one of our adventures had concluded safely. We had lots of fun. We were preparing for bed. We were in our giggly state. And, and then we were all laid down about to go to sleep, and the next thing you know, we hear a fire alarm. I had just had an experience with a fire in a house, so I was like, you know, I'm not messing around. I'm on the 23rd floor. I picked Jane up and ran down 23 flights of stairs with her, um, and we waited outside in my truck um, until they gave us the okay to go back into the into the building. And um... so she picks me up. We get in the elevator. <laughs> And she's standing there holding me. And there's still a bunch of firemen doing whatever they were doing. And this one fireman stepped into the elevator and looked at us and said, super loud. Wee, that's a big baby. <laughs> and I turned around and I said, excuse me? <laughs> and he just was horrified. <laughs> He didn't even say he was sorry because he was just like, oh, he's so hurt. 
And we were just giggling. We couldn't even say that. We couldn't even yell at him. That's a big baby. <laughs> Nice and tight, huh, Jane? Uh -huh. Oh, come on. We can zoom right up in on those eyeballs. Woo, cucumber eyeballs. Emily was so enthusiastic about supporting our friend Todd in his efforts to become the lady he is today that she got carried away and tried to turn me into the kind of lady that I am not. We just want to say that we think Jane is the greatest person in the world. You look bad. She entered me into the Miss Rachel Ohio pageant. That's totally not my style, but neither is quitting. So I gave it my best shot, and I still like her. And here we have Miss April. If you don't like video <laughs> <laughs> ravishing, simply ravishing. Show us a little leg, darling. Look at her. diamonds are a girl's best friend. As Jane competes for the Miss Wheelchair Ohio present. Give us a kiss, darling. We love you. The first runner up, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, congratulate Jane Ash. Madison has undergone a couple of big changes since earlier in the film. See if you can guess what they are. So I wanted to welcome you to my shop, which is Screamline Studios, deep in the heart of Painesville, Ohio. Uh, myself and two other partners rock the haunted house world. That's what we do. Jane is the um, it's a free-flowing 70s look now with her hair her hair is basically what we've done is we um, just rub glue in it that's that's how we do <laughs> just want people to know her some regular ordinary average people kind of <laughs> I'm not always conscious of how unconventional my lifestyle is, but I know that the average person off the street who is working for a home health aid job is not going to make it working with me. So when I do hire a new person, I do things to test them to see if they are going to make it or not. And Amanda had been with me for just a few weeks, and I really liked her. We connected, and I was hoping that she would stick around. But, again, I had to do something to, you know, see if she was tough enough to hang. Before the guy got here, she's running over. You know, it was my first time being here when she had, a, you know, a, a date, or whatever you want to call it. And um, she's... I just kind of asked, you know, what, what she wanted me to do. And that was my perfect opportunity to test her out. So I thought, yeah, as a matter of fact, there is something you can do. When I call you in the bedroom, you can, you know. Hold her while they're fuck having sex. Am I allowed to swear? No. Having sex? You can say anything. I can say anything? You can okay. say anything So she says, when they're in there fucking and she's riding and shit, I had 
to hold her and do this. And I about died because she really made it seem like that's what I had to do. And I probably would, I don't know. I love her, so I would have done a lot for her. I don't know if I went that far, but I guess if the shoe was on the other foot, I, you know, and I couldn't do it myself, and she really needed me to do that, I probably would. And she didn't quit. So she's a keeper. Kathy is the first independent home health aide that I hired, and that was nine years ago. I have come to realize that she has more energy and vitality than any of the aides and myself combined. Um, I mean, she's drawn, she's like a magnet. People are drawn to her no matter what. Because of the variety of the spice of life in Jane. That once you get past seeing her in her little physical self, um, you find the wholeness of who she is. But I like her because I believe midgets are magical. <laughs> <laughs> She's got me into all kinds of things that I would never do at my age. And I had, and <laughs> she goes, when she says, let's go to camp. And we went out to the camp, to camp in New York. It was a closed optional camp. It was an experience I never had before in my life. <laughs> I usually go without some panties or bra maybe like a few times. Just to try to fit in, but <laughs> nothing more. I get the pool, I get in the pool naked because I look like a fucking idiot. I went and spent $100 on a bathing suit last year. I'm the only one that had one on. Everybody's like, oh, that's so pretty. And I'm thinking, you motherfuckers. That ain't pretty. I spent all this money on this damn thing. I had to take it off. But nobody was, nobody had nothing on in, in that, in the swim, in the pool house. You know, so I look like the fucking idiot, like that's in a room full of people and I'm the only naked one there. That's how I felt. I'm thinking, fuck. I didn't Did have you to get, get that? Naked. Absolutely. Awesome. That's on right now? For the past eight years, I've spent a few weeks every summer at Brushwood Folklore Center, which is a clothing optional, family-oriented campground, and it hosts a variety of neo-pagan music and art festivals where costumes are encouraged. With each day of the festivals, the energy and excitement builds and culminates with a celebration that includes a two-story bonfire on the last night with drummers, dancers, and fire spinners. And that's when things took a turn <laughs> into my tent. Right. Nap. We took a nap. Someone joined us for a nap. <laughs> Jane, can you say hi? <laughs> Yeah, look, I'm tugging my mind. <laughs> <laughs> you got a video camera? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? I don't know. Wait, hey. I can't see because I don't have my glasses on. Chad! Yeah. 
Hi, Bella. Hi there. <laughs> One of the most common questions I get about sex is, well, how do you do it? Depending on who it is and how respectful they are when they ask it, depends on what kind of an answer they get. I don't know what they're thinking, why they would ask that. Do it like this. Damn it. Try to boot it. I have had enough of this computer. It is time to move on. I really don't know what deems a word politically correct or offensive. I suppose one reason that dwarf was chosen as acceptable is because it would cost too much money to change the name of a certain movie to Snow White and the Seven Midgets. However, I am not politically correct, and I really don't care what you call me, as long as you say it nice. And I think the word midget is funny. Who transplanted from the beautiful island of Hawaii to Northeast Ohio? In case you were wondering, yes, he is undergoing psychiatric treatment. He owns and operates the Coconut Hut, which is Jane's favorite neighborhood restaurant. Hey Jane, how's it going? Good, how are you today? What do you got going on today? Uh, lots of fish specials today. Uh, anything in particular you're looking for, we can totally help you out. Do you ever clean up some young guys? <coughs> Children often stare at me when I'm out in public, and sometimes they'll even ask questions. And I think that's great because that's how kids learn about people who are different. And sometimes they ask some pretty funny questions. One time, this preschool age boy came up to me and he said, Excuse me, lady, but are you a landmower? I expect the curiosity of children. 
and generally find it pretty amusing. But when a grown man or woman approaches me, pets me on the head, and screams into my face, Are you having fun? That's ignorant and entitled. I was at you know, some restaurant last week, and the booth next to us was full of women that kept gawking at me. Being rude. Usually I don't notice, but you know, sometimes you can feel people looking at you. So I tried doing that, looking at them and smiling and nodding. They still kept staring at me like I was an alien that just landed. So I developed spontaneous Tourette's syndrome and just started yelling out boobies and stuff and twitching, and they, they stopped looking at me. And as I was leaving, they gave me the sideways stare, like, if I'm not facing her, she's not going to know I'm looking at her. I appreciate those who don't stare at me. But for all you ass diggers and purse swingers, it is important to be aware of my perspective. such a dirty boy, I wouldn't have to get you shaved. You have a dreadlocks on your butt. That's not ladylike. You have to get your hair did. Screaming pussy. You want to be around her and you just want her to keep having these outrageous times. You want her to get tattooed. You may not want to see her piercings, but you want her to get pierced. My friend who I met in Sunday school years ago came to my New Year's party last year, and he's a body piercer now. He asked me if I wanted to get my nipples pierced at the party, and I said, sure, what the hell, it sounds like fun, and it turned out to be such a great party activity that several other people got pierced that night, too. We you know, as well suffer, okay. and so we would just immediately need to take her right across the street. There's the emergency room across the street. <laughs> we could go, we'd have to make it there in like less than 30 minutes for major, major brain damage. <laughs> <laughs> I 
believes that the energy that many refer to as God or Goddess lives inside every living thing, including animals, trees, and you and me. Collectively, we are God. I also have a passion for drum circles. It's an awesome opportunity for socialization with like-minded people. And there's a very primal, healing, spiritual element that's something to be felt rather than explained. By tapping into the collective consciousness, which is a huge energy generator, each of us has the ability to manifest our own reality. To put it simply, we have the power to make our own dreams come true. It's a challenge for me to separate my work, spirituality, and my social life because everything I do fulfills more than one of my needs. Ear candles are an ancient method of removing excess earwax, which satisfy a spiritual need I have to bring healing to others. This is goat urine. <laughs> <clears throat> this is olive oil. Do I have nice ear holes? You have the best ear holes I've ever had. No. No, you do because... You didn't tell me that last time. They, I don't have to wiggle the candle around. It just kind of, slides are they big, right are they big in. Are they small or are they medium or are they just right? They are just right. I want to know, kind of like, are they big holes or little holes? They're they're in between. Oh, I love you. Yeah. You know? I'm Mary. I'm one of Jane's caregivers. She actually gives me my B12 injection that I have to have. Otherwise, I'll be in a wheelchair just like her. I was in a wheelchair for about a year. Couldn't walk. And she helps me and... She was willing to do it. I can't do it myself because the four times I did it, I blacked out every time. But she was willing, and I don't watch. Me neither. We'll just stare at each other. Curdy, 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 That one hurt. But you're tense. Yeah. All right, you're not bleeding. Yay. A lot of folks here think that you know, assume that I'm like her caretaker or something, and I'm like. No, we just like, we share space, you know, we like live together, that's it, you know, you know, it's more like she's my caretaker sometimes, at least, you know. <laughs> that's been a awesome and challenging both, because I knew I could live with Jane. We both knew that. I didn't realize that living with Jane means living with Jane's from all days, and that's a challenge for me, that's a real challenge. She's a different kind of client for, uh, you know, for these folks, because... They're not just being hands and feet for someone, they're to some degree being brain for someone. And they don't have to do that with Jane. I interviewed and, you know, and suggested that, you know, oh, we can play games together and stuff. You know? Jane's like, oh no. <laughs> you know, you Excellent. think about it. It's like know. bobbing for apples. You know, he's <laughs> a lot of freaking apples. Alan invented. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> 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 it's recommended that I visit the doctor on a regular basis due to my bone condition. However, I choose not to because of the many negative experiences I've had in dealing with Western medicine. But after an auto accident, I decided to see an orthopedic specialist, and it turned out to be a positive experience. What has happened, unfortunately, that I think is the problem, because you had such a severe scoliosis of your spine, uh -huh. a shifting of the spine, it got inflamed terribly at the impact, and the muscles went into spasm. Mm. But there's nothing permanent here, which is good. So you would need to do another repeat bone density test. And when this is all said and done and you're feeling better, we can always have one ordered for you June or July. I would like to do yeah, that. To compare it with one done three years ago. Absolutely. It's a good idea, actually. Because if I reversed it, even I let it, that's a big deal. Yeah, it's huge. 
and with supplementation and things like that, you absolutely can. So I wasn't born with the scoliosis. It happened because I had surgery on this arm when I was a kid. Okay. And the cast they put around me was so heavy, it actually shifted mm -hmm. everything. So what I've been doing in my exercise routines is trying to shift it back. And you've done whatever you felt is best for your body and obviously right. your body tells you what it needs and you supplement with the herbals, with the yogas, with the stretches and it's working for you. So as you do what works and as long as you're doing this well, I'm not going to change anything in your structural formula of what you're doing. You're doing okay. great. So great. you keep up with the program. I think the therapist will make a big difference to mm -hmm. keep you lubricated, to keep you your tissues nice and lubed up with therapy and exercises and stretches. Things are all needed for you. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a good way to go. We're handed a deck of cards with a little bit different spine than everybody else. So our job is going to be to keep that spine as healthy as we can. And the way to do that is um, exercise strengthening program. And I believe omega-3 fish oil is a very good way to maintain some stability in your spine. Now, do you have any questions for me? Can you tell me what that, like, what is it? What, what part is what? Um, even the radiologist called me, interestingly enough, about you in that he hadn't seen anatomy like this before. There's a lot of what's called motion artifact in your, um, in your DVD. In other words, there's a little bit of movement and they couldn't really identify certain things that they were looking for, with the exception that we know that the spine looked pretty good. See, there's a little tailbone right here and there's the spinal cord as it comes up. So that's like looking at me from the side? Side view, yes. Okay. Yes. And those are your organs there? These are some of the organs here. Again, there's motion artifacts, so we can't really distinguish them very clearly, but your spinal column looks like this. People that are familiar with looking at MRIs think that we photoshopped this. No, oh, it's definitely not photoshopped. It could be coincidence too. I don't take things like this too seriously because of the, uh, I've seen so many images in different MRI scans over the mm -hmm. years, it doesn't surprise me, but if this image continuously reappears on you, I would most certainly consider looking into a Christian faith and start having people pray over you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. I'm looking at, well, the tailbone looks good, the sacrum looks right. good, the derma, the discs look all fine, but... Um, I mean, the ongoing twin thing is not that far-fetched. There were a lot of problems during my mom's pregnancy. And I actually have a friend that had to have her undeveloped twin removed from her. Um, I would not say that this is an unborn twin, no. When I was younger and I'd go out, my mother actually had a bottle of holy water that she would spray me with before I went out that night. <laughs> it's just as a protective thing. I understand. <laughs> My tattoo is a pentagram with a triple moon symbol, which represents all the elements in nature and each stage of a woman's life. Someone once asked me if it's a devil sign. Probably the same person who wrote in a public bathroom. I worship Saturn. I originally went to college so I could get a business management degree because I wanted to own and operate my own business. A few years into taking classes, I found out that if I became employed, I would lose my medical coverage. 
which means I would lose my wheelchairs and home health aids. If I had to pay for that out of my pocket, it would cost over $100,000 a year. So my motivation to complete my degree program was gone and I dropped out of school. Though I, I did earn a certificate. A few years later, after I helped pass new legislation to help people with disabilities integrate into the workforce without losing their medical coverage, I decided to go back to school. And within a year of studying, I got my certification to begin an alternative wellness business. And then I found out that the parts of the legislation that apply to me did not pass. What you see here is a paper trail of the unbelievable pile of shit that I have been through over the past two years. I was in an auto accident while being driven by a Medicaid-approved transport company. I have had to fire the attorney who was using my pain and suffering for his personal gain and disregarding my best interest. I had to have a CAT scan, MRI, x-rays, along with physical therapy. I got a big enough settlement on my own to purchase a home, though I did get manipulated by a corrupt real estate company, and I got bullied by a collections agency, which resulted in a spectacle in the streets of downtown Cleveland. Sounds like the makings of a country song, don't it? Riding on the short bus late one night Get us a gas pump, oh what a fright Doc says leave it up and you'll be fine There's no permanent damage he could find
health care grievance with our government, and following protocol to find a solution did not work. So I committed a nonviolent act of civil disobedience, which led to the police getting involved. But I did not get arrested. Unfortunately, I got the entire event on video, and I posted it online. Within a few days of posting it, I got a phone call from KUSF in Exile in San Francisco, offering me my own radio show. The parameters I was given were talk about disability-related issues and don't say fuck or cocksucker, which has proven to be a challenge, but a very rewarding one. And it's given me a lot of opportunities to interview really interesting people with disabilities, like Mary Rody Fletcher, who founded the first dance company in the United States that combines sit-down and stand-up dancers. Dancing Leo's schedule is pretty busy. What are you guys working on right now? Well, we have many things going on right now. Um, we calculated we have over 40, about 45 uh, tours in two months that we've been uh, working on. And we just came back into town and we'll be going out next week again. Uh, the company divides itself oftentimes so that we can be in two or more cities at one time. Here in Cleveland, what we're preparing for is our big uh, concert, and we'll have thir three world premieres, and it's going to be on uh, May 19th at the Allen Theater at Playhouse Square, and it's called Dare to be Different. So, we are very different. <laughs> Employment obstacles still exist. So I'm choosing to focus my time and energy on furthering my holistic education and being an activist for disability rights issues. I've had better days. How are you, officer? You can follow my work by subscribing to either or both of my blogs. I'm going to keep making noise until the problem is corrected. Um, that's just about it.
with the assumption that her brain does not function. <laughs>